Hello, thank you for watching my Evil God Monster of Abraham series. So far, I've got 13 episodes up, and I'm, uh, I've just now added some more of my Quickie with a Skeptic episodes kind of peppered in for you. I uh, hope you like it. Um, let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you, and take care. In this series, we'll examine the Book of Death, commonly referred to as the Bible, book by book, chapter by bloody chapter. Boring it sounds, but I promise it won't be boring. We'll be looking at the harm and atrocities caused directly by the malice of the God of Abraham. Stick around. Originally, I planned this series as a follow-up book to the Antitheist book I published back in 2013, but I decided to go ahead and create this video series instead, which I'll later convert into a book series of books as we go along. Keep an eye out for those. Also, I'll go ahead and put a link to my previous book, Antitheist, in the description below. Give it a look. First, I want to mention that I use the NIV version of the Bible found on BibleGateway.com. Unless there's some rhetorical point I'm trying to make which requires a more ancient version, this is the one I plan to use. It is, of course, the inerrant word of God, so it shouldn't matter which one I use. Now, as we all know, the first couple of chapters of the Bible are all about creation. In this episode, we're going to talk about the book of Genesis, chapter 1 which is a wide-angle view of God creating the heavens and the earth and the creatures, the waters, and then finally, man. Of course, there's nothing evil God-monster-like about this, is there? Well, technically, actually, absolutely, yes. It's just hard to see. But if you look, you'll find it. I mean, if this God is real and is responsible for creating all the creatures on earth, then he created a world where an uncountable number, certainly well into the trillions, of creatures who have existed throughout time have had to survive by killing and eating other creatures. Murder, death, kill, murder, death, kill, murder, death, kill, in one form or another since the dawn of time. The perfect opener to the book of death. And it's really perfect in its insidiousness. It talks about creation in a manner some people see as divine and beautiful, but there's no mention of how in order for any and all these creatures to survive, they must partake in the slaughter of and or consumption of the flesh of other animals. I mean, there's this big ball of energy right there in the sky and an all-knowing, almighty God could have made it to where every creature simply needed to absorb sunlight to live, but no. In all his wisdom and judgment, in this, his perfect creation, we must kill or scavenge on other living things to survive. Wholesale slaughter on a scale which is difficult, if not impossible, to comprehend. Exhibit A, the first piece of damning evidence which I use to justify calling it the evil god monster of Abraham, is book one, chapter one, of its own story. Some theists may try to equivocate this point and claim creatures didn't need to eat or kill at this point in the story, which makes their argument seem even less plausible. But really, I could let them have that one. Okay, so no animal had to kill to survive when it was all created. But maybe they wanted to argue it wasn't until the fall of man where that changed. And therefore, it's man's fault, not God's fault. Fine, done. Now, going on that premise... It's still the work of an evil god monster, but now he's even more cruel than we thought before because now the creatures God has set are under man's domain have to kill and consume the flesh of each other to live because man did something wrong. One man and one woman, in fact. All the other creatures of the earth for all time have to suffer horrible deaths to feed each other or horrible, yeah, horrible deaths to feed each other and or have to kill each other to survive. Really? That's not the creation I would think would be born of a peaceful, loving God. Quite the opposite, in fact. That sounds like a world created by someone who enjoys pain and suffering and death. Exactly the type of world the evil God monster would create. Although I will continue to go through the Bible to continue to exemplify my point, this alone I feel is enough. When looked at in the proper perspective, this clearly justifies why I call it the evil god monster of Abraham. Okay, so that's it for the opening episode of my evil god monster of Abraham series. What are your thoughts? Agree? Disagree? Let me know in the comments below. In my next episode, we'll examine chapter 2 of the book of death, where the evil god monster of Abraham institutionalizes the subjugation and slavery of women. Thank you for watching, and remember, don't get eternally damned to lesser YouTube channels. Click subscribe and hit that little notification bell. Thank you. Take care. Well, it doesn't take much to find examples of faith killing children. Imagine you had already had a child. That child was sick. You 
didn't take people's advice to take it to the doctor and that child died. Now you're facing murder charges and things have been going along in the courts and you've already gotten pregnant and you've had another child and that baby too is sick. Do you refuse to take the baby to the doctor or do you pray over the baby and hope once again, just like previous attempt that your prayers are heard and your baby is saved? What do you do? Stick around and I'll tell you about it. Hello. And welcome to the Daily Atheist, Quickie with the Skeptic Edition, Episode 5. Okay, before we get too far, use all the faith you can muster and reach out and hit that subscribe button and the like and give me a thumbs up, show me some love. All right, now, on with the show. Okay, so... For our first episode to really that really dives into this, I want to start with this couple here. Now, they're kind of a special case. As it seems, I'm going to go through this. They're, they're, um, they had a child, and the child was born with uh, jaundice and was ill. The midwife told her to take the baby to the doctor. Um, she refused and then dismissed the midwife. And then... Um, Shortly after that, the baby started coughing up blood, and then the next day the blood started coming out of the nose, and the baby wouldn't eat, and then the next day the baby died. And that's kind of the progression, despite other people telling her to take it to the doctor. Um, how they, and then they prayed over it, you know, um, hoping that their prayers would save their baby. And we know how it turned out. The baby died. And then, so they get thrown in jail and they're <laughs> on trial for murder of their first baby. They get, well, they, I guess they bonded out, I guess. And then they get themselves pregnant again. And then the baby is born. And again, they refuse to take the baby to the doctor. I guess that's a strong in faith, but oh man, that's powerful dumb. So... And the problem with this is, is, although these guys seem to be a worst case scenario, um, they're not an only case. It doesn't take a lot of searching and look around to find um, examples of where other parents have prayed their child to death. Here, this is one I find particular. You know, this guy here, he's some kind of nutbag who prays about all kinds of things and says ugly things about everybody. And look at him. He looks like he's pretty well fed. Um and this is his child, Mary. And despite being a farmer and all that, um, his baby daughter starved to death. Why did she starve to death? Was she sick and some reason she wouldn't eat? Or were they intentionally malnourishing and starving her? I'm not sure. I can't really find anywhere that says why she starved to death. Um, but they let her, let her die and never took her to the doctor, even though they said that she looked skinny for over a month. And then they would pray and their distrust for medicine. And, you know, he has a YouTube channel where he goes off on medicine and science and doctors and all. Of, and then he's got all kinds of signs around his yard where he's, I don't know if this article is going to cover it. I got some other articles here. So here's him, the examples of him, one of his videos spewing his nutbaggery. Talking about how. You know, the weak, if, you know, if they're not going to survive, they should die, right? Because it's evolution, the strong fit is survive, blah, 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 blah. Um, which is weird because he's not supposed to be an evolutionist, right? He's supposed to be a Christian. So why he would try to live by that and let his, the strong die. Anyway, so he's got a bunch of signs around his house that read craziness. Um, not just this, apparently I've seen, there, there we go. There's more. And it's, it's so clearly he's a religious nutbag. And despite everything, whenever, uh, it came down to it, he let his child die instead of taking her to the doctor. And then, you know, as we watch this video, um, right here as an example, this guy is, at first it looks like he's mad. Injustice has been done to him. He is angry. Um, as they're reading out the charges. In Solon Township that you're both charged with what they call felony murder while in the perpetration or attempted perpetration of child abuse in the first degree, they're alleging that you murdered one Mary Welch. That is a charge called homicide felony murder. 
It is life without parole. It requires a DNA sample to be taken upon arrest. And see, you see that look on his face that needs to stay there for a long time. And and others of his ilk need to see that. They need to they need to go into his church and watch this video. <laughs> Make them watch this. Cause I mean, look at his he went from angry and bravado to which is often like a cotton swab or in the inside of your cheek. The second offense that you're both charged with is called child abuse in the first degree, where they're alleging you knowingly or intentionally caused serious physical harm to a child. They're talking about this Mary Welch. It is a felony, possible penalty of up to life imprisonment or any term of years less than life. Now, those are the two separate felony charges. Okay, so, you know, and, and that's what I'm saying. That's right. They should go. They should go to jail. They should never breathe fresh air again. These guys are evil. I mean, not only did, again, they kill their kid, but they were these guys here were also prepared to do it again. She, at the time of this, I believe, was also pregnant. Different case, though. Different case in the first one over here where they actually got this baby here was jaundice. Um, I guess it had uh, medical reasons that are beyond my understanding. Allergic to her mother kind of stuff. I'm not sure. You can go read the article. Go find the article. But that was, was the problem. And it was easy to detect. Oh, hey, look, this is the problem. Look, baby sick. Um, and then they went and had another baby. Oh, look, baby sick, same way. Let's let's take it and pray. Um, matter of fact, if you read the article, it talks about how after this, the first baby died here, they went and called their friends at the church over to pray with them and tried to resurrect the child. That's how into it and crazy these people are. Um, so when the police arrived, there were three people praying over it, trying to res resurrect the baby. But that's kind of the crazy there. But again, here I am. Here these people are. Completely different couple. Everything. And same thing. They murdered their baby essentially by refusing. This guy here, though, you saw how he was angry. He was angry. And look how fat and healthy he is. They starved their kid for whatever reason. And they're farmers. You know, and their whole job, their whole life, livelihood is, is providing fresh food to people. And they starved their baby to death and prayed over it instead of taking it to the doctor. So... Um, just kind of an example of what you can do with some faith. Boom. Okay. So there's uh, an example. We're going to, I'm going to end it there on this one. Cause we're going with quickies with the skeptic and, um, I'll, I'll probably find out this is going to something that kind of really gets under my skin. If I see another one of these, I'm going to do another video. I'm going to point them out whenever this case ends up and we get that because apparently they're going to court on this, trying to determine how much rights these morons should have over their children. And, um, <clears throat> Whenever that all is all settled, I'll probably if I can if I find it or if I see it, I'll uh, I'll make a video on that. So, um, what are your thoughts on this? Let me know in the comments below, and don't forget to like, share, subscribe, bless it, pray over it, Jedi mind trick, do the thing, show me some love. All right, you guys take care. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to the Daily Atheist. In this episode of my Evil God Monster of Abraham series, we'll be covering Genesis chapter two of the Book of Death, where with the single word. The evil god monster of Abraham fires the first salvo in the religious war on women. Stick around. Okay, before we get too far along, I have to warn you that your soul will be found lacking for some reason probably related to your sexual organs by the amazing Super Chris. If you don't reach out and click that subscribe button, then hit that little notification bell. Don't get smited, my friends. Do it now. Now, on with the show. So where chapter one is a wide angle view of creation, chapter two is still zoomed out a bit, but it's a much closer picture, if you will. And it focuses primarily on the creation of paradise and man and woman. So as I read chapter two of Genesis in the book of death, I just want to point out a couple of logical inconsistencies as part of our atheist Bible study endeavors. In chapter one, it says plants were formed on the third day and man was formed on the sixth day. In chapter two, it says, no plants had formed on the earth, yet God created man, then the plants. Genesis 1 verse 11 through 13 said, Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, 
according to their various kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. Man, as we all know, was created on the sixth day in chapter one. But in Genesis 2, verses 5 through 7, it says, Now no shrub had yet appeared on earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. No rain, no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. In the following verses, God creates Eden and the plants, etc. Because now he has, according to the previous verses, the things he needs for the plants. Water and someone to tend them. It would appear that right from the start, the evil god monster of Abraham can't keep his story straight. Something his followers should consider. Or I guess continue to ignore. But wait, you say. It's the perfect word of a perfect, loving... Never mind. Moving on to the first domino in the chain that would result in the religious subjugation of women for generations to come. I will sum it all up in a single word. A helper. Verses 20 through 22 says, But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took of the man, one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. And he brought her to the man. See, in God's eyes, she's not an equal. She's a helper, an assistant, a, a servant, a beast of burden, albeit the perfect beast of burden, still a beast of burden. And you have to wonder, should women be a little insulted? I mean, literally, according to the Bible, God and man were looking for a suitable helper for man and went through and named every single animal before finally giving up and just making a woman out of man's rib, almost as a last ditch effort, it would seem. A little side note here to the Bible's credit. Woman is the only creature in this chapter not created from dirt good point to be made. In verse 18, it says, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him, a helper suitable for him. So we're off to make a helper for man. Verse 19 says, now the Lord God had formed out of the ground, all of the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to man to name. Then the end of verse 20 says, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found, which clearly implies that that's what they were doing, looking for Adam's helper. Now, I get it that in a way it's a compliment and that no animal, aside from woman, was good enough to be the helper of man. But wouldn't you think God would have known that to start? He could have made it to where man and woman together named the animals. This kind of makes it sound as if God and Adam just stumbled through all the various types of animals, seemingly taking a long, hard, lustful look at goats and sheep while searching for that perfect helper we now call woman. But by having man be created first and giving man dominion over the animals, you've already set him up to dominate over women. Then to create woman and literally biblically deem her a helper, you are sanctifying in the word of God that women are lesser and are to be controlled and dominated by men. How many women have suffered because of this? In all fundamental sects of any of these religions, the women are always lesser than men, servants to the men in one fashion or another. And all of them are forced into modesty, from head scarves to full-blown burkas and the habits of nuns. Even in their modern forms, few of these religions allow anything coming close to equality between men and women. And when they do, when pressed on the subject, they'll still admit in one way or another that the wife is the helper to the husband and subject to his, his will or domain. All because of a word. He could have said equal and created her sooner, but he said helper and created her last. And those, biblically speaking, were the first steps to the subjugation and oppression of woman by the men of the Abrahamic religions. The misogyny of a few ancient desert dwellers scribbled onto some scrolls sentenced untold millions of women to something akin to slavery. Exactly what you'd expect to find in the Book of Death, written by an evil god monster. I'd like to point out that, to her credit, woman is not present when man is told not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Of course, we all know she catches most of the blame later, but she's not there when God tells man. Point of fact. Maybe men should have been the ones having periods and dropping babies. Chapter 2 of Genesis. Another piece of damning evidence I put forth to justify calling it the evil God monster of Abraham, and for calling the Bible the book of death. 
Thank you for watching and stay tuned for the next episode where we cover Genesis chapter 3 in the Book of Death, wherein the aforementioned small-minded misogynistic men of the ancient Middle East continued their barrage and sealed the fate of countless women across the millennia, again wrapped in a single word, Eve. If you like what I do, show me some validation by swinging by my Patreon and showing me some love. Do the thing at the place with the stuff for the guy. I'm the guy. Before you go, remember to click that subscribe button. Hit that little notification bell. Don't disappoint the amazing Super Chris, lest you be smited. And we wouldn't want that. That would be unfortunate. Thank you and take care. Hello all, Chris Mallard here, atheist extraordinaire, host of the Daily Atheist Morning Show, and currently burning in hell. Oh, don't worry about me. I'm not dead. I'm just down here for the annual Christmas party. Ow, 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 ow. I mean, I mean, annual solstice awards party. The Dark One, or Lucy as he is affectionately known, is personally handing out the awards. Aaron Ra is getting the award for the most souls brought down by evolution for his African fossil hunt. And Matt Dillahunty has won the Golden Phallus Award for being a dick to the most Christians. Oh wait, it's the Golden Fallacy Award for the confusing the most Christians. Easy mistake to make. To top it off, Seth Andrews has lent his voice to the Gregarian chants this year. It's delightfully hellish. Gotta run. I hope you all had a happy Thanksgiving, if you're into that sort of thing. And I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas. Ow, 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 ow. I mean, a, a happy holidays, happy solstice, and a happy new year. Stay safe, heathens. Party hard. Fornicate. That sort of thing. But do it safely. Modern art of Jesus Christ is not based on Cesare Borgia. Surprised? Me too. Hello, and welcome to The Daily Atheist. Quickie with the Skeptic Edition, Episode 2. Hi, my name is Chris. We have five minutes or less, so no time to dawdle. Show me some love. Thumbs up, subscribe, share. You know the routine. Now, on with the show. Allow me to introduce you to my friend. His name is Cesare Borgia. He was born in September 1475 and died in March of 1507. Some people think he's the model for our modern notion of Jesus, but he's not. I know, I know, I thought so too, but it looks like we were wrong. I'd heard the rumors and seen the pictures, shrugged and went on, but apparently there's more to it than I thought. We know Jesus looked more like this guy than this guy. But the misconception we have now is not because of Cesare Borgia. It's more due to our nature to make our gods look like ourselves than any influence Pope Alexander VI may have had. Actually, though, this is an easy one. All we have to do is look to artwork of Jesus before the birth of Cesare Borgia. This show topic was a suggestion from my Facebook friend Robert Smith. So, blame him. Thank you, Robert. Let's go back here to artwork of the 14th, early 14th century. Here are a couple of paintings from an early 14th century painter named Duccio di Buonensegna, an Italian artist painting who he believed to be Middle Eastern people. Although this Christ is a little more olive skinned, he does have the typical beard and hair in each of these photographs. Here, in The Lamentation of Christ by Giotto de Bandone, circa 1306, we see another Italian artist before the birth of Cesare Borgia painting a similar looking Jesus, similar beard and hair, but this one is distinctly more white, as are all these sun-kissed Middle Eastern folk. Except this one guy. He looks like he's blushing. He must have farted or something. Anyway, here's one of the best images disproving the Cesare Borgia theory. This is Ece Omo, and was painted by a Dutch artist named Hieronymus Bosch around the time Cesare Borgia was born. Painted between 1475 and 1485 at best, Borgia would have been about five years old when this was painted. Painted, I might add, by a man in a faraway country who spoke a completely different language. Now, when we go back and look at the picture of Cesare Borgia, we'll notice there's this little note here. <clears throat> that says portrait of a man traditionally said to be Cesare Borgia. Not exactly a positive ID. And he was known to be infected by syphilis, so severely in fact that he wore a leather mask to cover 
his disfigurement. Also, here's a look at his father, Pope Alexander VI. That dude is powerful ugly, even in his own commissioned artwork. I suspect what really happened was that Pope Alexander VI had a rather homely child, whose unfortunate looks were compounded with a nasty case of syphilis. And when the artwork was commissioned, it was Cesare Borgia who was painted to look like the notion they already had of Jesus Christ, as borne out by their other artworks from previous times, and not Jesus, who was painted to look like Cesare Borgia. What do you think? Am I right or am I right or am I right? Let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to give me a thumbs up, click that subscribe button, hit that notification bell. Thank you for your time. Hello and welcome to The Daily Atheist. I'm Chris Mallard. Thank you for joining me. In this episode of the Evil God Monster of Abraham series, we'll cover Genesis chapter 3 in the Book of Death, the chapter in which God made woman a second-class citizen when compared to man, and by his simple non-inclusion, damned the gays and trans people to religious persecution, which has lasted for thousands of years. Also, it literally, biblically, commands women to be subservient to their husbands. The word helper from chapter 2 apparently just wasn't doing it. No surprise coming from the book of death. Stick around. Okay, the evil god monster is watching, and he doesn't want you to hit that subscribe button and that little notification bell. He's trying to push you around, and I don't think you should put up with that crap. Click the button, hit the bell, do the thing, show him who's the boss. Thumb your nose at the Almighty. Do it now. And now, on with the show. Special thanks to my patrons, merch buyers, and those friends out there who provide moral support. You guys are wonderful. Thank you. Okay, chapter one gave us a wide-angle view of creation, and chapter two narrowed the focus a bit, giving us an idea of how everything comes about. Chapter three picks up there and gives us an up close and personal view really of the fall of woman oh they call it the fall of man but really man was just a spineless onlooker who apparently did nothing to protect the innocent eve from the serpent then he tossed her ass under the god bus so fast she didn't even have time to read the license plate and while we're here at the beginning of chapter three i want to mention that there's no clue given as to how long they dwelt in the garden these naked apes locked in the god monster zoo before the serpent came along and freed them i mean chapter two ends with adam and eve getting created and dropped in the garden then chapter three opens with the serpent coming in did they get any quality time at all with the almighty before everything went to hell oh wait hell didn't exist so scratch that part did they exist for blissful centuries walking around naked in the garden with their junk hanging out enjoying the shining love of the almighty god did God walk around with his junk hanging out? Hmm. Doesn't say, but you have to wonder whether or not he was circumcised, right? As much fuss as he makes about such things. Questions, pesky questions. Maybe that's where they hit questions. And is being naked good or bad in God's eyes? Most religions would have you believe exposing your naked body is a horrible, horrible thing. Yet God wanted his zoo apes naked and he wanted them to be okay with that. Why don't we follow that example? Maybe the nude beach folks are the ones who are doing it right. I mean, in fact, the very first thing that happened when they ate the fruit was that they realized they were naked. God wanted Adam and Eve to be naked and to be ignorant. Pourquoi? And if it's wrong to look upon naked people, why did God wish to do it so badly? Also, it seems they're more like active slaves than passive zoo animals. According to chapter 2, man was created and commanded specifically to tend the garden. Genesis 2 verses 15 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Two people kept naked and secluded and expected to toil for their slave master, the evil god monster of Abraham, presumably for all eternity kind of sounds like slavery in perpetuity to me. I mean... There are many ways to describe what we're reading in Genesis 3, but this description seems to be one of the more accurate. But back to their time in the garden. To be honest, it reads as if as soon as they were dropped in the garden, the serpent pops up and does his thing. Apparently, if there was ever any paradise to be enjoyed in, well, paradise, 
it would seem as though they didn't get to enjoy it very long. So Eden was built to sit empty all this time. Wouldn't God know that? Sounds like a horrible waste of time and resources. It's like building a skyscraper, having a couple of people move in one of the rooms for a week or so, then kicking them out and letting the entire place sit empty and rot for the rest of time. Imagine laying brick by brick on walls two rooms that you knew would never be used. Hmm, logical? No. And how did they while away the centuries, excuse me, minutes, in the garden, just chilling and eating fruit while waiting for God to come, traipsing through his almighty phallus, flopping free? Or was it work, 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 tending the garden all the live long day while they waited for their slave master to return? Either way, it doesn't sound like a very interesting existence, to say the least. I say good on Eve for taking the fruit and breaking out of that prison of the mind and body. Remember, in a book written by an evil god monster, those who resist or who are considered sinful should be seen as the good guys to a normal moral person. Nod to you, serpent and Eve. Every free mind alive today owes you a debt of gratitude. Okay, so back to the text. In chapter 2, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man... You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Perhaps calling it the tree of death would have been more of a deterrent, don't you think? I want to make a couple of points about these last couple of verses real quick. One is that of all the places in the universe, we don't even have to do the whole universe. In all of the world, you put your favorite creation, who doesn't know right from wrong, good or evil, within walking distance of the one tree whose fruit he shouldn't eat of. Hmm. And then, like the final you know, footwear to fall, would be that you tell him about it. Really, sounds like a trap to me. Why not put that tree on a remote desert island or on Mars or anywhere else? A thousand miles to the east across some mountains would have sufficed. And we'll just slide right by the whole why make the tree at all thing. Of course, it's all just a metaphor, right? Just a really bad metaphor. Okay, so bumping back to chapter 3. The serpent shows up and convinces the woman to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Then she gives some to the man who eats of it. Wait, what? Yep, he was there. But there's no mention of any attempt on his part to stop her or in any way dissuade her from eating of the fruit. Chapter 3 verse 6 ends with, She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and who ate it. Who was with her? So, they eat the fruit, and they realize they're naked. Then sewed together some fig leaves and hid in the garden. Then God comes along, looking for them, and can't find them. And he doesn't know what they've done. Hmm. So either he isn't all-knowing, because he didn't know they had eaten of the tree, nor where they were, or he knew and failed to protect his children, who, by that logic, he surely must have known were in danger. Didn't he know what the serpent would do? Then why put the serpent anywhere near his favorite creation? Or, again, why create the serpent at all? And here's an interesting point to remember. As soon as God asks who told them they were naked, Adam responds, Genesis 3, verse 12, the man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Eve, meet bus. Bus, meet Eve. I would have asked for the license number of the bus, but it all happened so fast. Let's look at the fact. Eve was not present when God told Adam not to eat the fruit, but Adam was there when the serpent convinced Eve, an innocent who knew not of good and evil. Then, when God gets angry, he slaps man on the wrist, but punishes woman most severely. In fact, the punishment for the serpent and man hardly seems like any real kind of punishment at all. The serpent already crawled upon the ground, so it doesn't seem like much of a punishment. Hashtag punished, right? Man already toiled the earth as part of his work in the garden. Punishing him by making him work the ground to feed himself when he was already doing that doesn't seem like much of a punishment. Although it does say God makes the ground harder and men will have to eat the plants of the field. So perhaps that's it. Hard ground and now you have to eat your vegetables too, not just the fruits. Ouch. Hashtag punished. The sting from that must really smart. But woman... 
woman was punished most severely. Genesis 3 verse 16 says, To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Apparently, her desire for her husband and his rule over her is punishment. It's a punishment, not something to be considered a joy. You just saw it there yourself. Go read the book. But there's a catch. Not only will she have to have pain in childbirth, which there has never been any children and is not something she's already doing, but now she's officially been promoted from a helper to a slave. And I quote, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you, rule over you. And it's not like woman doesn't have to work the ground to eat and she doesn't have to eat vegetables too, right? So she suffer his fate and fears, but he doesn't have to suffer hers. And how does this all affect the gays and transgendered people? Notice that during creation, it's just man and woman. No mention of gays or transgendered people or any of that anywhere. No ambiguity at all, in fact, which has directly led to the mistreatment of countless gay, lesbian, and trans people throughout history, not only by the church, but by complete strangers and even their own families, often using the battle cry of Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. On the news, for example, how many times have you heard of a gay or trans person been beaten to death by some religious nutbag? And it happens all over the world. From Africa to Alabama, people are killed for the type of person they love or for the non-standard configuration of their genitalia. Surely, an all-knowing, all-loving God would have known about the gays and trans and loved them, right? Nope. This is absolutely typical of the evil God monster of Abraham. No mention of them so they don't exist, which many believers apparently take to mean they shouldn't exist. In this one chapter, the evil god monster of Abraham outright damns women to slavery and servitude for actions that hardly seem her fault or even worthy of punishment at all, while at the same time, by not mentioning gay and trans people, it dooms them to abuse, mistreatment, and as we've already discussed, murder. And there you have it, the small-minded, misogynistic men of the deserts of the Middle East, setting in stone, if you will, the God-sanctioned subjugation of women and the persecution of anyone not clearly male or female. The number of women and gay or trans people who have been tormented, enslaved, tortured, raped, and murdered by people referencing this specific chapter is staggering. No surprise coming from the evil God monster's book of death. Thank you for all your support. Please head over to Patreon and show me some love. Do the thing at the place for the guy. I'm the guy. Remember, give the finger to the evil god monster and hit that subscribe button and notification bell. Thank you and take care. Hello and welcome to The Daily Atheist. I'm Chris Mallard. Thank you for joining me. In this episode of the Evil God Monster of Abraham series, we'll cover Genesis chapter 4 in the Book of Death, the chapter in which Eve fulfills her final duty as a birth slave and God sets brother against brother to quench his thirst for blood, in a recurring theme that will play out again and again for thousands of years, brothers and believers slaughtering each other by the millions in the name of God stick around. Okay, I need to warn you that Adam and Eve and baby Jesus will all cry angel tears if you don't click that subscribe button and hit that little notification bell. So you better do it now. Now, on with the show. In the Bible, the first three chapters give us a quick rundown of creation, and chapters two and three make sure to put woman in her place. Despite being a helper, we never see her do anything, literally anything, beyond creating sin. No other lessons to be learned from Eve at all, just sin. Now, in chapter 4, she's going to have a few babies, all boys of course, fulfilling her duty to bear children. Then she vanishes, mentioned later only when reminding women of their place. In fact, her only line in this chapter, I've gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord, surely smacks of misogyny. Not just any kind of child, but specifically a man-child. Eve herself is telling all women who come after her that, well, almond joy is better than a mounds, and every time you feel like a nut. In the next couple of chapters, the authors will waste mad amounts of space and words just telling us which man descended from which man, the true exemplification of a patriarchal line. A mindless string of boring, meaningless begats when... 
it could have been teaching us about the lives of Adam and Eve and given her character some meaning, besides just being the cause of sin and the first human 3D printer. I mean, it opens with Eve dropping a couple of babies, then forgets about her for the rest of the chapter until we need her to crank out another baby. Eve fulfilling her purpose. She caused the sin which caused the downfall of all of humanity. Then she drops some babies and she's out. She has three babies in chapter 4, Cain, Abel, and Seth. Then in Genesis chapter 5, verse 4, it says, And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. Then he begat more children, we presume, with Eve is the last direct indirect mention of her in the Bible. After this, when the Bible refers to Eve, it's to vilify her for the sins she created or to point out how she was lesser than Adam. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray by the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. You may have heard that scripture, 1 Timothy 2 12, which says, But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain silent. That's a fairly popular one, an old chestnut, if you will. But did you know the very next scriptures, 1 Timothy 2, 13 and 14, blame Eve for this? For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. In my previous videos, I mentioned how having Adam be created first, in a way, gave him dominion over Eve. Here, we see someone who has read that text and is using it against women. We didn't have to wait for modern examples of someone oppressing women because of their interpretation of the Eve story. It happens right here in a later chapter of the Bible. Hmm. So at this point, let's forget Eve. The Bible certainly does. And besides, this god monster craves blood. In fact, it's not hard to find examples of the followers of the evil god monster of Abraham killing each other. Jews kill each other throughout the Old Testament. Christians have been killing each other since the foundations of their church. And Muslim has been killing Muslim since the death of Muhammad and probably before. Believer killing believer, brother killing brother. And why not? The fourth chapter in the book of death opens with brother killing brother, prompted directly by the actions of the evil god monster of Abraham. An interesting side note, it's not just brother against brother. In a way, the Bible sets farmer against herder. I'm curious if there's ever been any animosity between farmers and herders because of the way the Bible treats Cain and Abel. If you know of some examples, let me know in the comments below. Let me explain that though. Genesis 4 verse 3 says, And she bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. There seems to be a negative connotation to the word but here, and at first I thought it was just me reading into it. But it sure seems like the author favors herders over farmers. In the following scriptures, Cain offers God the fruit of the ground, and Abel offers the fat of the firstlings of his flock, both offerings presumably being the best of what their trades produced. Yet God frowns on Cain's offering and smiles on Abel's, which stirs Cain against Abel. Perhaps nothing, perhaps a subtle slight to those who work the ground. Anyway, back to the main point. Something I want to mention is that in earlier chapters of the Book of Death, it mentions God specifically makes working the ground hard. And I would argue that farming in those days was probably a lot more labor intensive than herding. Not that both aren't hard, but in this case, God specifically increased one's difficulty level as a punishment. So in other words, Cain worked his ass off, slaving under the curse of God in the hardened ground. Then he offers God his best and was shunned while his younger brother, Abel, worked less, offered less the fat of the flock, not the meat, but was given the praise of God. Then when Cain was upset for being shunned, God adds insult to injury by saying, Genesis chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. Wait. He did well. It doesn't say he made a bad offering. It says he chose to work the field, which should be noble considering the difficulty level involved, and he brought the fruit of the field as an offering. What's wrong with that? How is that not good, and why is it not accepted? No reason is given. So do you blame him for getting mad and making a face? So what comes next, 
doesn't make a lot of sense for several reasons. As we all know, Cain kills Abel, but they were both raised by Adam and Eve in the presence of God himself, who literally interacts and talks to these people. Yet, despite all this, Cain murders his brother because he's not getting enough godly attention. Wouldn't God know what he was doing would drive Cain to murder? Talk about some bad parenting. Somebody clearly didn't get hugged enough as a child. Either Cain was quite a fragile individual to let such things disturb him to the point of killing his brother, or there was more to it than what is told in the Bible. Either way, it looks a lot like a setup. Just as Eve was set up by God to fail in the Garden of Eden in chapters 2 and 3, Cain is clearly being set up here, although her punishment is much more severe. It's almost as though he's being rewarded for the bloodshed he caused. Throughout the Old Testament, including the next chapter, it's demonstrated that to live a long life was a reward from God, and yet Cain was punished, not by being killed, but by being given a long life, Genesis 4, verses 15. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one would kill him. Hashtag punished. And apparently his other punishment was not being allowed to work the ground. Genesis 4, verses 12 says, when you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crop for you, which doesn't really sound so bad because it was such a crap job anyway. So, hashtag punished. And he was made to be a restless wanderer on the earth. Our first poet. Aw, oh, poor baby. He goes on to live a long life and have many children. Hashtag punished. All things you would consider as rewards, not punishments. Once again, a slap on the wrist compared to Eve's fate. A woman eats a piece of fruit and she's damned to be a slave to her husband and to have pain in childbirth all the live long day. Not only that, but she damns all women who follow her to the same fate. But a man murders his brother and all he has to do is change jobs and move to another city. Hashtag punished. So now, reflecting back on my opening statement about believers killing one another to satisfy this god monster's bloodlust, it's easy to see why they do it. Right out of the gate, the example has been set. The very first man to murder another man does so for the love of God. Cain became jealous of God and killed Abel, all while God sat and watched. And likewise, for thousands of years, generation after generation, they slaughter each other and everyone else in the name of their God the evil god monster of Abraham and his book of death. So what are your thoughts? Do you think Cain's punishment was severe enough? Was Eve's punishment too severe? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you for all your support. Please head over to Patreon and show me some love. Do the thing at the place for the guy. I'm the guy. Oh, and don't forget to avail yourself of some of my merch. Merch is good. Remember, avoid angel tears from baby Jesus. They burn like acid. And hit that subscribe and notification bell. Thank you, and take care. Hello, thank you for watching my Evil God Monster of Abraham series. So far, I've got 13 episodes up, and I'm, uh, I've just now added some more of my Quickie with a Skeptic episodes kind of peppered in for you. I uh, hope you like it. Um, let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you, and take care. Are you feeling the world is leaving you behind? Do you look at all the pseudoscience, rumors, and wild speculation on the internet and wonder, why can't I do that? Well, friend, you can. We can help you. We are Conspirawin. Conspirawin has a long history of helping anyone with a hidden truth. We will get your message out. The conspiracy theories you see today all started out with one person's vision. The moon landing hoax was launched by a NASA engineer whose manager didn't okay his vacation request. Conspirawin was there to help out. Christianity started out because one little girl named Mary got pregnant out of wedlock, and Conspirawin saved the day. Now, the virgin birth is accepted Catholic doctrine. You may be thinking, but my idea of the center of the earth being made of ice is far-fetched. No one's going to believe that. In a world where people believe windmills cause cancer, we say no dream is too big. Conspirawin will take your fledgling idea and feed it to our YouTube, Twitter, and TikTok operatives. And these savvy social media professionals will raise doubts with the prevailing scientific consensus. They will say, no one has ever seen the planet's core, except Jesus. And science is wrong all the time. That's why science has theories and not Jesus.
Within 30 days, we guarantee you CNN will run a story on how your conspiracy theory isn't true. We will also give you 100% assurance Fox News will say your crazy idea about the Earth's core being an icy ball is true. Follow your heart. Listen to the voices no one else can hear. Team up with Conspirowin. Hello and welcome to The Daily Atheist. I'm Chris Mallard. Thank you for joining me. In this episode of the Evil God Monster of Abraham series, we'll cover Genesis chapter 5 in the Book of Death. The chapter in which Tom begat Harry, who begat Dick, who ad nauseum begat, begat, begat. Boring, useless, and wasteful. But we'll make it fun. Stick around. Hi there. Did you know that if you take the first word from the first 10 of my videos and put them in a sentence, it reads, No moss on green hats for battery-flavored old babies. Which, in the original tongue, translates into hit that subscribe button and then that little notification bell. Like and share, people. Help spread my nutbaggery. Honestly, that's really what the translation says. Now, on with the show. Okay, so rather than beat a dead horse here, I'm just going to lightly whip it a little. The misogyny, which began in chapter 2, no surprise, continues on to chapter 5. How so, you ask? Well, chapter 5 is essentially a lineage, men and women having children, and those children go on to have children. Well, wait, that's not really what happens here. Men have the children. No wives or mothers are ever mentioned, and these children go on to have other men who also have children. Throughout chapter 5, not a single woman is named. Women are only referred to in the beginning when it says God created male and female, and after that only when stating that a man had many sons and daughters. Other than that, they're not worth mention. We all know the efforts which go into making a baby. Man does his part, then the woman carries the child, births the child, tends the child, etc. Who changes the diapers? Who makes the clothes? Who cooks for the child? Right, the mother. In almost every culture, the world over, women bear the brunt of child rearing. Yet not a single woman is named, nor given any kind of credit in chapter 5. Men spread their seed, men have sons who have names and go on to have sons, while women remain nameless, and are referred to only when stating that a man had sons and daughters. Almost like an afterthought. No surprise though, right, given how the text and its followers treat women, either as slaves or birthing ovens, and often as both. Okay, the dead horse called misogyny has now been properly tenderized. So, on with the secret code. Okay, so in Deep Space Nine, the Grand Nagus, sort of like the King of the Ferengi, goes into the wormhole of the prophets and comes back changed. Instead of being his usual greedy self, he becomes very benevolent and no longer lusts after latinum and gold. He even rewrites their sacred book, The Rules of Acquisition, turning it from a book of greed to a book of love and kindness. Quark, one of the main characters, doesn't believe it and thinks it's all a scam. He thinks the Nega is doing all this as some kind of scheme, or that there must be some kind of hidden message of truth, read that as greed, hidden somewhere in the book. So to that end, he says to his brother Rom, it must be some kind of code. Read me the first word of every rule. Rom opens the book and reads each word as he flips the pages. If never, keep profit, a good smile, honesty. Quark leaps to his feet and says, aha, if never keep profit, a good smile, honesty. Well, what does it mean, Rom asks. Quark responds, it means absolutely nothing. But wait, in their case, it does kind of mean something. Following the motif of the story, we could interpret it as, if you never keep profit, you could always have a good smile. You could infer that the next line formed in such a manner might be, honesty is the best policy. But we just kind of made that up, huh? Right here, just like the Christians. In this case, it was not a message the Ferengi were wanting to hear, so to them it meant nothing. Similarly, people seem to think that there's a hidden code in the names of the men listed in the begats of chapter 5 of Genesis, and that it's not just a waste of space. If you believe, then it could mean everything. Validation for your beliefs and proof that God is there trying to communicate with us in secret, hidden ways. If you don't believe, then it's just a bunch of nonsense. So let's take a look at the secret message in Genesis 5. What could it possibly be? The 11 spices to the kernel secret recipe? 10 ways to earn money working from home. Or maybe it's something actually useful, like telling them to boil their water before they drank it. 
perhaps the atomic weight of boron? Nope. The ten names from Adam to Noah when put together in a sentence and translated means man is appointed, a mortal man of sorrow is born. The glory of God shall come down instructing that his death shall bring those in despair, comfort, and rest. Well, at least that's what it means according to the biblecodes.org and you get essentially the same thing from the YouTube video hidden message in Genesis 5. Is that a miracle? Or is it more likely that one had it first and the other saw it and repeated it? Either way, it's uncanny. It gives me the tingles. <laughs> but here in the Messiah in Genesis 5 by 119 Ministries, it says something completely different. Let's go through it step by step. Adam simply means a man. The literal meaning of Seth is the word substituted. Okay, so Adam means man. But you'll notice later when they say the word man, they don't use Adam. None of the words with man in them as part of the translation have Adam in the word. Just an interesting point. According to this, Seth literally means substituted. Really? That's what you name your kid? That's a ridiculous name for a child. Hey, substituted, how's it hanging today? Over here at BibleCodes.org, they say Seth means appointed. So is it substituted or appointed? Apologists, please don't embarrass yourself by trying to explain that they're the same thing, because we know they're not. Enosh is usually rendered as a man, but it is a plural function, meaning people or the human race. The root word related to Enosh means very sick or incurable. So the meaning when all is considered is incurable man or very sick human race. So far with Adam, Seth, and Enosh, we have a man substituted incurable man. Enosh means either people, incurable, or a mortal of man. You see where I'm going with this? No Adam in the word Enosh, by the way. Not only is it a real stretch to imagine that this list of names is an actual message from God, but can you imagine giving children's names like this? Daddy, why did you name me very sick human race? Well, because we were making a string of names in what will be a dead language that, when you put them together later, will mean absolutely nothing. Of course. Does this fit Yeshua? Here is some scripture to consider. By Yeshua, he means Jesus. Super eye roll. So, at this point, he's going to start just chucking random scriptures from both the Old and New Testament to try to shoehorn this one in. This is a perfect example of modern Christians trying to jam Jesus into the Old Testament trying to create prophecy where none existed. Yeshua substituting incurable man. Isaiah 53 verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. 2 Corinthians 5:21. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 1 Peter 2.24 He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Our Messiah substituted his perfect self for our sin. We were incurable and very sick, and through him we are healed. In this case, his interpretation is, a man substituted incurable man, which he uses Jesus as the man who substituted himself for our sins. And then he justifies it with the aforementioned random scriptures. Mediocre attempt at best. Now we need to determine the Hebrew meaning of Canaan and Mahalalel. Canaan literally means possession or possessing. The root word means to erect. Mahalalel means praise of God. The root word means shining light. Canaan means possessing. Very sick human race, quit picking on to erect a light, or I'm going to tell substituted on you. You see how dumb that's starting to sound? John chapter 8. Again, Yeshua spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Psalm 119.5. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Of course, here he goes jamming Christ into it everywhere it mentions light. Erect a light in book 5 of Genesis somehow means Jesus because in John, literally hundreds of years later, it says Jesus claimed he was the light of the world. Why didn't they just say Jesus then in the beginning? Why the wordplay and the obfuscation? 
Why go through all the trouble to hide a scripture, even one as poorly constructed as this one, when they walked around and talked about this stuff all the time? It's not like it's some kind of secret. If they wanted to be mysterious, they could have turned and broken the fourth wall and said, person, reading this book later, Jesus is the light, the Son of God, by stock in Yahoo, etc., etc., yada, yada. But no, obfuscation and metaphor. And wait, what does Kenan mean according to the BibleCodes.org? Well, Kenan means sorrow is born. Clearly a different translation, right? Can you imagine having that embroidered on his tiny little booties? Sorrow is born. Oh, how cute. We should have them bronze aged. Hmm. An indoctrinated individual might be amazed that hundreds of years later this alluded to that, or they might be convinced that that one thing meant the other. But to someone who has put any real objective mental effort into it can clearly see this is a bunch of made up after the fact nonsense. The actual ancient translations are so hard to find or are so obscure that it makes it easy for people to bend it however they like, as exemplified by these two different translations by two completely different believers. Make it up. Say it with confidence or authority, and people will believe it. And this is not really about having an education or being intelligent or not. People believe this nonsense because they want to. I have to say that no matter how intelligent you are, even if you are the tops at all the Mensa parties, it doesn't matter if you want to believe it. If you want to believe this gibberish, and you want to find power and mystery in these words, and you don't have a problem being dishonest with yourself, you'll find a way. I'm not going to bore you by making you watch the rest of the video. Let's go ahead and skip to the end. Look at the differences between these two translations. Man is appointed. A mortal man of sorrow is born. The glory of God shall come down, instructing that his death shall bring those in despair comfort and rest. Biblecodes.org But according to the other interpretations, a man substituted incurable man and erected the shining light of God by coming down to teach. He is the branch bringing mighty youthful rest. The perfect immutable word of God, clearly less than perfect and quite muted. Some people claim the Bible holds mysteries which we're still unable to comprehend at this time, which means it's literally trash to the billions of people who've come along before and can't understand it or crack the code. Isaac Newton, genius by all rights, studied the Bible as hard as he did the sciences, and despite cracking gravity, he never found any meaningful codes or hidden messages in the Bible. Hmm. It's all a distraction, and Occam's razor really does apply. All these begats are just someone trying to validate Noah by creating a string of names between him and Adam. Trying to shove Jesus in there is just embarrassing. So here's an entire chapter wasted to tell us nothing more than Noah was a direct descendant of Adam. Ten generations of parentage literally without mention of the wives and mothers who birthed these men. And daughters are only mentioned as an afterthought, typical of the evil god monster of Abraham and his book of death. So what do you think? Do you buy the notion that there's a hidden message buried in the begats of the Bible? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you for all your support. Please head over to the Patreon and show me some love. Do the thing at the place for the guy. I'm the guy. And remember, the secret message from my first 10 videos says, a gambling crab walks high in the panties on Tuesday, which of course is a subtle nuanced translation of hit the subscribe button and that little notification bell. Thank you and take care. Hello and welcome to The Daily Atheist. I'm Chris Mallard. Thank you for joining me. In this episode of the Evil God Monster of Abraham series, we'll cover Genesis chapter 6 in the Book of Death, the chapter in which the peaceful, loving, forgiving God of the Bible plots to murder the world. Stick around. Okay, I have to warn you that there's a big nasty Nephilim out there going around dry humping the legs of people who don't hit that subscribe button and that little notification bell. So you better do it now. Stay safe, my friends. Now, on with the show. Will the misogyny in the Bible ever end? Well, no. The answer, the answer is no. Genesis chapter 6 opens with, When human beings began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. So yes, recurring theme, women are things to be taken and used. And it doesn't exactly say rape, but... What in the Bible gives the notion that there was any type of consent involved? It says they married any of them they chose, period. And just because they married them does not imply consent. 
Forced marriages today, right now in our modern world, prove marriage does not equal consent. And who are these sons of God? Are men not the sons of God? Or is this supposed to mean angels or some kind of other heavenly creature? For argument's sake, we'll call them angels, but no, I'm not being specific. Blanket term for heavenly creatures. Of course, there are other ancient tomes of knowledge we could dig into to learn more about what later scholars thought these creatures were, but the purpose of this series is not to go that deep. This is supposed to be the inerrant word of God. We're putting it to the test. I have a few points to make here on the first couple of verses. One is that, didn't they have beautiful angel women? If they don't have angel women, then the angel men really probably wouldn't have a need for human women or any woman at all, right? So why would an angel want a human woman? Or did God pop these things into existence complete with dorks and a healthy lust for women, but no actual females of their own? That's just dumb. See, the guy pinning this in the shade of a desert tent, the low coo of mating camels in the background, probably didn't think this part through very well. And my second point is that the text describes them literally as the sons of God, as though he issued them himself. So one would think they would be pious and holy, yet these heavenly creatures came down and married human women. Did they build cities, sing songs, or do literally anything else in the universe before they went sex happy for human women? Nope. It reads like they popped into existence for the sole purpose of running a sex riot on mankind, and God just let them. God could learn a thing or two about crafting a backstory from George Lucas, I'm just saying. Oh sure, God got mad later, but apparently he did nothing to stop this interspecies sex romp. And it should be noted, however, that nowhere does it state the marriage of the sons of God to the daughters of humans was a sin or bad or wicked. Neither does it infer the presence of the Nephilim as bad or wicked. Humans are the only things described as wicked in this chapter. And another thing, it directly implies that human women are so beautiful they tempted these heavenly beings. Yet us men are expected to rein ourselves in around them? Hmm. Remember, scriptures like these are often used to justify forcing women into modesty, to contain their beauty so us men won't be forced into sin. Also, if there are angel females, do they have to cover their hair and live in modesty in heaven? Hmm. A quick change of subject. I want to point out that the very next verse, Genesis 6, verse 3, where the Bible says, Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years. So right there, it states that God does not want to spend eternity with humans and that they will die. It does not say they will have an eternal afterlife. It does not say that we'll go to heaven. Do not pass. Do not collect $200. I repeat, living with humans on an eternal scale seem to be explicitly against the wishes of God. No afterlife, no heaven, 120 years tops, then you're out. Okay, onward and upward. So far, we've only covered the first three verses of the chapter. Verse 4 names the Nephilim, says they were here before and after the sons of God came and enjoyed the human women. Says they were heroes of old then that's it. They're done. All that wrapped up into a single line and then forgotten. Wasting my time. But now we, we start to get to the good stuff. For the first four verses, it essentially talks about how God let his heavenly pets loose on mankind to rape, pillage, corrupt, and plunder. The next two verses are God getting pissed and flipping tables because of the wickedness of man. Verse 5, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. What other methods did God use to stop the wickedness? Did he stop the sons of God and the Nephilim from corrupting his pet humans? No. Notice how, despite letting man get tainted by these non-human creatures, he blames men, and especially women, of course, for the indiscretion. Does it say he sent prophets to teach them and warn them? No. And what happened to the sons of God and the Nephilim? And despite how wicked the sons of God sound, the verse specifically says the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become. 
no mention of any punishment to, for any of these outside instigators. It was presumed the Nephilim and the sons of God were killed in the flood, but it doesn't say so directly. Man, once again, literally being set up to fail by the evil god monster of Abraham. Another nod to you, unknown desert scholar. But look, here we are, six freaking chapters deep into this book of love by the God of mercy, and there's no talk of culture, art, music, medicine, love, romance, poetry, forgiveness, the successful cities that had been created under his rule. Nothing. No wonder, no glory, no magnificence at all. The first three chapters are about creation and how women are little more than birth slaves. The fourth chapter is a riveting MMA style tale about God instigating the very first children born in this world to fight to the death for his love and attention. Then a wasted chapter trying to prove Noah is descended from Adam. That's it. No glory, mercy, or tenderness of love in all of God's creation. Think about that for a moment. Let it sink in. God of love, God of death. Hmm. Now, in chapter 6, God is literally going to admit heaven tainted humans, then blame humans, and prepare to rage quit on the whole human race. It's worth noting here, side note, that verse 14 says that the ark is to be coated inside and out with pitch, which is a black tar substance. But the ark is always depicted as a brown wooden boat. Shouldn't it be black if it's covered in pitch? Anyway, back to the matter at hand. In verse 8, the Bible introduces us to Noah, and the rest of the chapter is God continuing to rail against the wickedness of mankind and telling Noah to pack up his shit and build the ark. God angrily scribbling in the sand as he plots the genocide of the human race. Very Hitler-esque, don't you think? But then there's the part where God really starts to show his tender, loving, merciful side. Genesis 6, verse 17. And I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. Everything, not just the wicked humans, but everything. The women and children, the elderly, the infirmed, puppies and kittens, goats and sheep, essentially you and the horse you rode in on. Don't painlessly blink them out of existence. No, the terrifying death of drowning in a flood is so much more merciful and demonstrative of your love and capacity for forgiveness. God of love, God of death. God of murder, God of suffering, God written by that syphilis-riddled woman-hater sitting in the shade of a desert tent eating his own lice and scribbling down the holy word. For time's sake, we'll skip over the well-trodden obvious nonsense, like how the ark could even laughably hold two of every creature plus every kind of food to feed them. Yeah, every kind of food, which it specifically states in chapter 6, verse 21. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. And how they got all the penguins and kangaroos and those creatures, how they made it back and forth to those specific locations and how they did it without dying and without leaving any evidence like bones along the way. We'll just skip all that. I've heard the argument that God simply willed it to be. Well, if God could do that, then why didn't he just will the wickedness out of the hearts of men? Puny God. So, objectify women, corrupt man, then blame man for the corruption, and then get with one of your pets, looking at you, Noah, and plotting the murderous, drowning deaths of millions of people. Exactly what you would expect from the evil god monster of Abraham and his book of death. So what do you think? Are female angels too ugly to knock boots with? Do they exist at all? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you for your support. Please head over to Patreon and show me some love. Do the thing at the place for the guy. I am the guy. Remember, a naughty Nephilim will know your leg in a biblical sense, sans lubricant, if you don't hit that subscribe button and that little notification bell. Thank you and take care. Hello all, Chris Mallard here, atheist extraordinaire, host of the Daily Atheist Morning Show, and currently burning in hell. Oh, don't worry about me. I'm not dead. I'm just down here for the annual Christmas party. Ow, 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 ow. I mean, I mean, annual solstice awards party. The Dark One, or Lucy as he is affectionately known, is personally handing out the awards. Aaron Ra is getting the award for the most souls brought down by evolution for his African fossil hunt. And Matt Dillahunty has won the Golden Phallus Award for being a dick to the most Christians. Oh wait, it's the Golden Fallacy Award for the confusing the most Christians. Easy mistake to make. To top it off, Seth Andrews has lent his voice to the Gregarian chants this year. It's delightfully hellish. Gotta run. I hope you all had a happy Thanksgiving, if you're into that sort of thing. And I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas. Ow, 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 ow.
I mean, a, a happy holidays, happy solstice, and a happy new year. Stay safe, heathens. Party hard, fornicate, that sort of thing. But do it safely. Hello, and welcome to The Daily Atheist. I'm Chris Mallard. Thank you for joining me. In this episode of the Evil God Monster of Abraham series, we'll cover Genesis chapter 7 in the Book of Death, the chapter in which we see the endless wrath of the loving, forgiving, merciful God of the Bible as he murders the world. Stick around. Okay, you never know when God is going to flood the earth again, so make sure you're safe. Let us know you have on your God-proof swim floaties by clicking that subscribe button, then hitting that little notification bell. Stay safe from the evil God monster, my friends. Now, on with the show. So let's start with the low-hanging fruit here. We all know that the evil god monster brags about killing all the creatures of the world in the story of Noah. I could stop there and argue that point if you like. We could once again talk about the innocent babies and kittens, puppies, elderly, infirm, sinful, and innocent alike who didn't just die but were horrifyingly drowned in a flood. Oh sure, the text tells us that all the people of the earth had wickedness in their heart, but really, every child had wickedness in its heart? Murder all the animals because the people have wickedness in their heart? See, this god monster brags about doing such things. So, slam dunk for me. These episodes practically write themselves. But wait, there's more. More, you say? Why, yes. There are many forms of harm. In an earlier chapter, I mentioned how the authors of the Bible tend to waste precious time and page space on nonsense when they could have used it for more moral lessons. Things like not to rape people. Not to take young girls as sex slaves. Not to talk in the theater and not to put pineapple on pizza for God's sake. You know, modern notions of morality. And here, once again, we see a wasted opportunity. Lots of wasted opportunities. Genesis 7 verses 2 and 3 say, Take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, and one pair of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate, and also seven pairs of every kinds of bird male and female, to keep their various kind alive throughout the earth. Then it says in verse 4, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. Then it says Noah did as commanded, so we can presume all the animals are on the boat. Then it tells us how old Noah is. Then in verse 8 and 9 it tells us again about the animals as they enter the ark. Pairs of clean and unclean animals, of birds and all of the creatures that move along the ground, male and female, came to Noah and entered the ark, as God had commanded. Verse 11 again points out Noah's age, this time down to the day to indicate when the flood started, because that's powerfully important information. Then in verse 12 it again says rain fell for how long? How long did it fall for? 40 days and 40 nights, echoing verse 4. Verses 14 and 16 again tell us about all the animals. They had with them every wild animal according to its kind, all livestock according to their kind, every creature that moves along the ground according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, everything with wings. Pairs of all creatures that have the breath of life in them came to Noah and entered the ark. The animals going in were male and female of every living thing. Well, wait, didn't it just say that in verse 8 and 9? Deja vu, huh? Now, verse 17 needs to remind us once again that the flood continued for how long? 40 days. And then verse 17, 18, and 19, and 20 all say the same thing over and over again, just in different ways with subtle little differences. 17. For 40 days the flood kept coming on the earth, and as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. Verse 18. The water rose and increased greatly on the earth. And the ark floated on the surface of the water. Verse 19. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. Verse 20. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 15 cubits. You see where I'm going with this? Then verse 21 through 23 does the same thing. Repeats the same idea over and over again. Verse 21, every living thing that moved on the land perished, birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swarm over the earth, and all mankind. Verse 22, everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Verse 23, every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and the creatures that move along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth. 
Is that not a massive waste of time? You can argue that there are subtle differences, and there are, but come on. Just one of those lines could have said something like, after the flood, Noah and his family learned it was important to boil their water before they drank it, or they could get sick and die. But no, just more crazy talk. Let's not toss actual useful information in there. Is there some kind of hidden secret meaning buried within the text? If so, it's useless trash to most of the billions of people who've read it and not picked up that meaning. Would looking at the original text yield a clearer meaning and a better message? If it does, again, it's useless trash since most people will never experience that version. If the Bible were the word of a perfect God, it would be perfectly clear to anyone, regardless of language or century, and we'd all believe. This God of death so fetishes its own murderous ways, it chooses to echo them over and over again here at the end of the chapter, instead of providing actual, useful information. Exactly the kind of thing you'd expect from the evil god monster of Abraham in his book of death. So what do you think? Apologist, how do you defend the actions of this creature? Let me know in the comments below. If you like what I do and you'd like to support my cause, follow the link in my description to my Patreon and find a tier that works for you. Thank you for all your help and your support. I appreciate it. Remember, let us know you're safe and that you have your anti-God floaties on by hitting that subscribe button and that little notification bell. Stay safe, my friends. Hello, and welcome to The Daily Atheist. I'm Chris Mallard. Thank you for joining me. In this episode of the Evil God Monster of Abraham series, we'll cover Genesis chapter 8 in the Book of Death. The chapter, which is actually two different tellings of what happened after the flood. Read as a single story, it reads kind of like a moron wrote it. Looking at you, syphilis-laden, lice-infected, woman-hating, goat-loving author of the Bible. Read separately, though, it makes for two completely coherent stories, written by two completely different morons. Stick around. Okay, before we get too far along, don't let God get you. I want to remind you to protect yourself from the evil god monster of Abraham by going to the Daily Atheist Facebook page and giving it a like. Smash that thumbs up button, hit that little notification bell. Stay safe, my friends. Now, on with the show. What he said. Okay, so as I was reading chapter 8, I started to make some points about how crazy it all seemed. Then something hit me. It's not actually one story. It's two completely different tellings of the same story. Let's take a look at these two versions. Chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, are actually two separate introductions to the two different versions of the story jammed together. Version 1. Verse 1, But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark, and he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. Introduction of version 2, which is verses 2 through 3.5. Now the spring of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed, and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth. Back to version 1, verses 3.5 and verse 4. At the end of the 150 days, the water had gone down, and on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. Back to version 2. Verse 5. The waters continued to recede until the 10th month, and on the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains became visible. So in one version of the story, the waters were there for seven months. In the second version, it was 10. And to read this like a single story in the order it was written, it reads as though the ark already rested upon the mountain, and the waters had receded, and the mountain tops were visible. Then Noah sent out a raven who flew around until the water was gone. But wasn't it already gone? But anyway, the water's gone. But then he sends out a dove, which couldn't find a dry place to land. He waits for seven days. The dove come back with a leaf. He waits seven more days. The dove doesn't come back. As one story, it reads like a bunch of nonsense, but as two separate stories, verses 15 through 19 are just Noah and the animals leaving the ark, twice. Again, two different versions of the same tale. And it's also quite wasteful in its wording. In the first version, verse 15, instead of saying, God said to Noah, you and your family can leave the ark, it said, God said to Noah, come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Then again, in the second version, verse 18, it does it again. It's not Noah and his family left the ark. No, it's so Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his son's wives. 
Lots of wasted space in words. If we switch to older Bible versions, I'm sure the wording and waste would only get worse. And we couldn't even get through this chapter without at least a little bit of misogyny slipping through. Listing all the men first, then the women in one version. It's not Noah and his wife, his sons and their wives, which of course is still patriarchal, but not to be unexpected. But no, it's penises first all the way in one version of the story. Noah and the boys, the wife and the girls. And then there are the animals. Of course, there's lots of waste of space in each version as it tells us once again, excuse me, twice again, about all the damned animals. Version 1, verse 19, could have said every creature came out of the ark. Instead, we get something similar to chapter 7's word vomit nonsense. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you. Could have stopped there, but no. The birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground. So they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number. Version 2, more word vomit. All the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground and all the birds, everything that moves on land, came out of the ark, one kind after another. And as you would expect, the last few verses are the ends of the two different stories. In one, Noah builds an altar to God, burns some animals, and God sings a song. And in the other, God promises to never rage quit on humanity again and does some navel gazing about all the murder, death, kill he's done. Then he promises to never do it again. These verses at the end are just more mashed together than the rest. I'll split them apart and add them to their complete separate versions of the story here in just a second. So here we go. Version 1 in its complete form. Remember, this is chapter 8 with about half the scriptures cut out of it. Should be a completely incoherent story. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. After forty days, Noah opened a window he had made in the ark and sent out a raven. And it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground, so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma. Then the Lord sings, As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and hard, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. See what I mean by sings? Looks like the Almighty rocks it a cappella at this point. Remember, before reading version 1, I said I'd removed half the scriptures from the chapter? Well, here are those scriptures. Again, if I'm wrong, this should sound like a bunch of complete nonsense. Here we go. Version 2. Now, the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed, and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The waters receded steadily from the earth. The waters continued to recede until the tenth month, and on the first day of the tenth month, the tops of the mountains became visible. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove could find nowhere to perch because there was water all over the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out his hand and took the dove and brought it back to himself in the ark. He waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. He waited seven more days and sent the dove out again, but this time it did not return. So Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his son's wives, all the animals and all the creatures that moved along the ground and all the birds. Everything that moves on land came out of the ark, one kind after another. Then the Lord said, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. There you have it, two completely different tellings of the same story, but with some minor detail differences. But Chris, where does the evil God monster part come in, you ask? Didn't you know? Genesis chapter 8 is the first time we hear God admit to liking the smell of burning flesh. Yes, the God of love and mercy loves it when you kill an animal and burn its flesh. And it's not that they kill the animal so they can eat it. At this point in the story, people don't eat animals, only plants. Well, 
at least according to the next chapter where God specifically tells man to start eating the animals. So apparently they killed these animals for no reason other than to burn their flesh so the Lord could enjoy the smell. Exactly what you'd expect from the evil God monster of Abraham and its book of death. So what do you think? Do you agree with me that there are two similar but different stories being jammed together here? Let me know in the comments below. If you like what I do and you'd like to support my cause, follow the link in the description below to my Patreon and find a tier that works for you. Remember, liking the Daily Atheist Facebook page can protect you. Don't let that God thing smell your burning flesh from the evil God monster of Abraham. Hit that subscribe button and then that little notification bell. Thank you and take care. Peace. Hello and welcome to The Daily Atheist. I'm Chris Mallard. Thank you for joining me. In this episode of The Evil God Monster of Abraham, we'll cover Genesis chapter 9 in the Book of Death, the chapter in which God dooms the animals, officially, to be food for humans, and his current favorite human, Noah, gets drunk and curses an innocent child to a life of slavery for the actions of its father. Loving, merciful fun for the whole family. Stick around. Friends, protect yourself from the curses of an angry, drunken Noah by clicking that subscribe button and hitting that little notification bell. Stay safe, my friends. Now, on with the show. This chapter truly is a testament to God. A testament that it's a bloodthirsty monster with concern for little other than blood and pain and misery. It also, again, shows us how multiple tellings of the same story have been jammed together to make a single, almost unintelligible tale. So, as with the last chapter, we still have two concurrent stories being told here. Which is why in verse 1 of chapter 9, God tells Noah and his sons to be fruitful and multiply, and why it does it again in verse 7. Rather than reading you every word of both stories like I did in the last video, I'm just going to show you briefly where the two stories run. Verse 1. God tells Noah to be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Verse 7, God says it again. Be fruitful and increase in number. Multiply on the earth and increase upon it. Verse 2, God tells Noah all animals will fear man and that they are given into your hands. Verse 3 says the same thing but shorter and more direct. Everything that moves about will be food for you. I give you everything. Verse 4 actually looks like it should be tacked on to the end of verse 3. I give you everything, but don't eat meat with lifeblood still in it. Stop. Next paragraph, similar theme, separate idea. It's still about blood, but the thoughts are completely different. Now it's about killing people. Then the next line is about animals. Then the following line is back to talking about humans. And for each human being too, I will demand an accounting for the lifeblood of another human being. Do we have to account for every animal we kill? Or is it saying animals will have to account for any humans they kill? Hard to say. Moving on. As with one of the two stories comprising the previous chapter, the God in this chapter also likes to sing. Does the God of peace and love sing of mercy and forgiveness or joy and happiness? Hell no. Not surprisingly, it sings about blood and retribution. Genesis 9 verse 6. Whoever sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. The God of death loves blood. If blood is spilled, only more blood will satiate this monster. No turning the other cheek here, no mention of mercy. Now, this whole paragraph containing verses 8 through 11 is repeated in verse 12 through 16. Yeah, there are some differences, like the latter version has rainbows, but clearly there are two versions of the same thing with slight differences. Again, two stories jammed into one. So now that I'm done talking about the two in one angle, let's look at the morality of this evil god monster and its favorite humans throughout the chapter. The first part of both stories is God telling Noah and his sons to be fruitful and multiply. Then God gives man dominion over the animals. I want to take a moment to point out that at this point in the story, animals have done nothing, nothing, and played no role other than being passengers on Noah's ark and being used as burnt offerings to God. And now they are being subject to being killed and eaten by man. And not just that, but God even specifically says in verse 2, the fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth. Again, no mention of mercy or love, just fear and dread, blood and suffering in this God creature's book. Then God says to not kill each other, but if you do, the one doing the killing must be killed. 
Then God sings his song demanding blood for blood. Then God makes a covenant with essentially everything on earth to never kill it again with a global flood. Now we're to the end of the chapter and things switch from God's covenant with Noah and the creatures of the earth to focusing on Noah and his family specifically. Remember, Noah and his family are chosen by God. First, for context, let's hearken back to chapter 6, verse 9, which says, This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. And chapter 7, verse 1, The Lord then said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. And finally, Genesis 9, verse 1, Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. So these are supposed to be the best of the best. Literally, God's chosen, specifically saved by God to repopulate the earth. So what's the first thing Noah does after he gets off the ark? And burns some animals, of course. Well, he builds a winery. They are literally still living in tents, and this guy makes a winery. Then he gets drunk and passes out naked in his own tent which apparently is a bad thing. His youngest son, Ham, goes into the tent, sees him naked, and then goes outside and tells his brothers, who then cover Noah up without seeing him naked. Then Noah wakes up, finds out that his son, Ham, saw him naked, and then he does what? Multiple choice. He thanks Ham for letting someone know and getting him covered up. He forgives Ham for seeing him naked. He asks forgiveness from his family for becoming so drunk and not covering his junk. He curses his own grandson, Ham's innocent son, Canaan, to a life of slavery for Ham's actions. Remember, before you answer, this is Noah, chosen above all others because of his rightness with God. Yep, you guessed it. He cursed an innocent child to slavery. Genesis 9 verses 24 through 27 says, When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. He also said, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend Jepheth's territory. May Jepheth live in the tents of Shem. And may Canaan be the slave of Jepheth. A quick shout out to Canaan and Jepheth if you're watching. Sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, guys. Sorry. Je Je Jepath, Jepeth, Canaan, Canaan. E either way. Sorry, guys. So to wrap up chapter 9, God gives animals to humans for food. Lucky animals. God demands blood for blood. Swears off global floods. Then Noah gets drunk and curses his innocent grandson to slavery. Another chapter with lots of pain, blood, misery, and fear, but no love or kindness or mercy to be found. Oh, sure, he promised to never drown the world again. But did you read how he described humans in the last chapter? Genesis 8 verse 21. Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. <laughs> These are not the words of a loving God. No, that sounds like a creature who hates and is disgusted by mankind. And if you ask me, this assertion is vindicated by the fact, the fact, that this god monster goes on to slaughter its own followers en masse for the slightest infraction throughout the Bible. You really can't argue this point because God literally just finished killing off the entire human race except Noah and his family. And not to put too fine a point on it, Noah's descendants will be slaughtering each other in no time on the command of God. Who does Moses, a descendant of Shem, the son of Noah, slaughter on his way to the promised land? That's right, the Canaanites, the descendants of Ham, the son of Noah. Murder, death, kill, murder, death, kill, murder, death, kill. Exactly what you'd expect from the evil god monster of Abraham and its book of death. So what do you think? Do you still see the two different stories being jammed together here? Can you find love and mercy hidden among the fear mongering and death in this chapter? Let me know in the comments below. If you like what I do and you'd like to support my cause, follow the link in the description below to my Patreon and find a tier that works for you. Remember, ward off any drunken Noah curses by hitting that subscribe button and then that little notification bell. Thank you and take care. Hello, thank you for watching my Evil God Monster of Abraham series. So far, I've got 13 episodes up and I'm, uh, I've just now added some more of my Quickie with a Skeptic episodes kind of peppered in for you. I uh, hope you like it. Um, let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you, and take care. Yes, stupidity can kill. Today I'm angry, frustrated, at what I see as intentional stupidity in our world that literally kills people. 
Hello, and welcome to The Daily Atheist, Quickie with the Skeptic Edition, Episode 3. Hi, my name is Chris. Show me some love. Thumbs up, share, like, subscribe, ring that little notification bell. You know what to do. Now, on with the show. A 13-year-old boy named Edgar Lopez died in August of 2014. Not because his parents followed the advice of an herbalist and stopped giving their son his insulin. No. It was because when their son got sick from not taking the insulin, they continued consulting the herbalist, who continued to tell them not to give their son his medicine and to not take him to the doctor. Surely this is a clear case of murder, right? On the part of the herbalist? This guy is 84 years old. He is going to spend the rest of his life in prison, right? Or at least, at the very least, he's not going to be able to continue to spread his nutbaggery. Am I right? Nope. And how is it not murder for the parents who continued to follow his advice despite having experience with the medicine and knowing the effect of not taking it? He was on insulin, so they had to have at least once have gone to the doctor, been given instructions, and knew how to administer his medicine, and certainly should have known the effect he would go through if he didn't take it. Let's go over this article from the Washington Post. Here is the herbalist describing in his own words how he feels about insulin. Obviously, this was recorded before the incident, but it clearly shows his belief in that insulin is bad, poison even. Insulin is very poison to the system. Even medicine tells you that insulin makes you, all the organs of the body three times older than the body is. Yet and still, there's all kinds of herbs out there that is natural insulin. Watermelon is natural insulin. Okay, so that's his take on insulin. Pretty loony if you ask me. Now I realize the parents probably don't have a very good education and they don't speak English, but I find it difficult to believe that they believed him when he said it was poison and that their child would get killed at the hospital. That's just stupid. It's ridiculous. Read that as worthy of ridicule not only to make such a claim, but that anyone would believe it. Also, further down in the article, <clears throat> the father says that Morrow told them the for-profit American health care system benefited from making sure people stayed sick. So which is it? Do they kill people or do they keep them sick? Admittedly, you don't make nearly as much on a dead 13-year-old as you do with one who has a chronic, possibly debilitating disease. Those are cash cows. You don't kill those off. So I still lay a lot of the blame on the parents. They were willfully ignorant and stupid, and it got their kid killed. I'm sorry for, for Edgar Lopez. I'm, I'm sorry your parents fell for this charlatan. They literally turned away from the only real magic that could have saved their son, modern medical science. Despite all its successes, and tried two different types of nutbaggery, essential oils, and prayer, and watched their child die. But here's what really gets me. This jackass essentially murders this little boy, and prosecutors charge him with one count of practicing medicine without a license, and one count of child abuse causing death, which at the time of the charges were brought could lead to a maximum of two years in jail. Hmm. Well, we found out this week that after his sentencing, that he only gets four months behind bars and four years probation. And if any other person dies listening to his nutbaggery, he may be charged with murder. What the hell? Talk about a slap on the wrist. That man should never breathe free air again, let alone be allowed to continue to push his nutbaggery. He is literally a danger to society. Edgar Lopez will never grow up, never graduate high school, never get married, never have children. His entire life has been taken from him by this man and his nutbaggery. Yet Mr. Morrow gets to carry on hawking his snake oil to the ignorant for money, putting other innocent and ignorant lives at risk for the almighty dollar. The American way, I suppose. 
This is what happens when poorly educated, unscrupulous people are allowed to do whatever nutbaggery they want to other poorly educated and clearly irresponsible people. And you know, those parents were praying their asses off, hoping Jesus would step in and save their child. They even claimed that Morrow called his cure God's insulin. Right? So, you know, why didn't they actually use the real insulin that really worked? If you don't know how to science, you shouldn't be allowed to claim you do. If your medicine is not science or backed up by science, you should not be allowed to claim that it is or that it's better. Four months of jail time and probation for killing a child, combined with the fact that this guy doesn't even get his business shut down. His videos are still up on YouTube as of this recording. Essentially, broadcasting to all other charlatans out there that even if the worst case scenario happens, worst case, if your nutbaggery kills a little kid, don't worry about it. You'll still be able to make a living. You'll have to go through some jail and a little bit of legal troubles, but you'll get away with it. It's okay. That's worst case. What happens, you know, if it just causes minor problems, the rash, or, you know, these people are just going to get away with all kinds of stuff. Doesn't matter. I mean, sure, why not? If you can kill a kid and only get four months... That's, that's the signal that these people are showing out. I find it personally disgusting. It's just wrong. Do you agree with me or no? What do you think about essential oils and their application in the in the today's modern medicine? I, you know, I, I get some things. That I'm going to make a whole video about tree bark aspirin. Another video on the healing properties of marijuana. They're, they're both possible and powerful. You know, there's a lot of things that are possible out there. But whenever you've got something, and it's especially something dire and important like this, your own child is sitting here dying, take them to the doctor. Let medicine do its work, you know. Um, the, or if they don't, they should pay the price. They should be set as an example to other parents what happens to you if you let your kid die. These kind of things. Do you disagree? Agree? What are your thoughts on it? Leave me some hate down in the comments. Don't really leave me some hate. Uh, but, um, yeah, let me know what you think. And I'm going to try to learn a little bit more about it over time. I've been really busy. Uh, essential oils is not really my bag. I don't put a lot of mental effort into it. Um, I'm going to do some research on the interwebs and consult uh, fellow skeptics. Another one, one of his name, uh, the genetically modified skeptic. He is, or was in the beginning, quite big on uh, essential oils and their applications and their nutbaggery. So I'm going to look into his stuff and get some more advice. You might, I'm going to put a link down to his channel uh, in below and you can check out his stuff and see what you think. Let me know what you think. Comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little notification bell. Thank you very much for your time. Have a great day. Hello, and welcome to The Daily Atheist. I'm Chris Mallard. Thank you for joining me. In this episode of the Evil God Monster of Abraham series, we'll cover Genesis chapter 10 and the Book of Death, the chapter in which God's chosen people from the flood repopulate the earth, the entire earth repopulated without mention of a single woman. Stick around. Thank you for following my nutbaggery through these 10 chapters of the Bible. Become a full-fledged junior birdman and show your support by clicking that subscribe button and then hitting that little notification bell. And don't forget to give me a thumbs up. Now, on with the show. We are now 10 chapters into the Bible, and so far, we've seen no love or mercy, no joy, no happiness, nothing. Just judgment, pain, fear, death, and of course, blood. In this chapter, we'll once again be beguiled by boring begats for pretty much the entire chapter, but things will start to pick up from here. The Tower of Babel and the story of Abraham are coming soon, and I think you're going to love my thoughts on Abraham. Okay, so this chapter is the biggest sausage party yet in the Bible. It's going to tell us of all the descendants of the three sons of Noah and how they are the ancestors of all the tribes of these various peoples throughout the world. And not a single woman is mentioned. The complete repopulation of the earth and the spawning of hundreds of nations, yet not a single mom, sister, daughter, or wife is ever named. A recurring theme in the Book of Death is it strives to keep the boot of men on the throats of women. Yet, in previous chapters, women were at least mentioned in one fashion or another, even if it was only to say that a man had sons and daughters. But not in this chapter. They are completely invisible. 
but it does kind of make sense. Women were clearly things to be possessed and birth slaves to be used to have sons. It's only our modern notions of equality that make us feel like they deserve some form of credit. Many goats were used for milk and meat to feed these sons, yet goats aren't mentioned or acknowledged. Many donkeys were used to carry them to and fro, yet they don't name the donkeys. And many tents were used to cover them from the heat and the cold, yet the tents aren't mentioned either. So why should the women be any different? This chapter is nothing but a waste of space. There were some people the author didn't like, so he vilified them by making them the descendants of someone he saw as bad, or who was seen as bad in earlier chapters of the Bible. Ham, for the sin of seeing his father naked, was cursed. Oh, wait, that's right. Noah didn't curse Ham for seeing him naked. He cursed Ham's son, Canaan, an innocent child who had nothing to do with the sin of the father as far as the text reveals. And Canaan's descendants go on to be the bad guys in later stories. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah are descendants of Canaan, murdered by God for their sinful ways. And Moses in the Hebrews slaughtered who to get to the promised land? That's right, the Canaanites, the namesake descendants of Canaan himself. Misogyny, 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 murder, death, kill, murder, death, kill, murder, death, kill. Exactly what you'd expect from the evil god monster of Abraham and its book of death. Are you enjoying the series so far? Let me know in the comments below. If you like what I do and you'd like to support my cause, follow the link in the description below to my Patreon and find a tier that works for you. Remember to hit that subscribe button, then that little notification bell so you'll never miss a moment of my crazy as I release it. Hello and welcome to Shakespeare with a redneck. What the? I am Wild Bill Wigglestick and I'll be your handsome host, your gilded guide, your cowboy concierge of Shakespeare. Dude, really? Today on Shakespeare with a Redneck, I'm going to perform the prologue from Romeo and Juliet. Damn it, Bill. <sighs> Two households, both alike in dignity in fair Verona where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventured piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents' strife. The fearful passage of their death marked love and the continuance of their parents' rage, which but their children's end not could remove, is now the two hours traffic of our stage, the which, if you with patient ears attend, what here shall miss, our toil shall strive to mend. Hey, that wasn't half bad. I'm not as dumb as I look. Of course not. You'd be in a coma. Okay, so here's a quick rundown of the situation. Bill, two snot-nosed brats ignore the warnings of their learned parents and end up getting four people killed. Bill, come on, man. You're always blah, blah, atheist stuff, blah, blah, boring. Say something fun, for goodness sake. What? Particle is a fun word. Bill, particle, particle, particle. Bill, or talk about horses and dogs. People love horses and dogs. Or boobies. Everybody loves boobies. Bill. Oh, can I say boobies on YouTube? If you close your eyes, it doesn't count. Talk about boobies then. Okay, everybody loves those cute little blue-footed bastards. It hurts right here. Culture, baby, coming at you. Avoid bringing a plague on both your houses. A plague on both your houses? By hitting that subscribe button, then that little notification button. And bang that thumbs up button like frisky cousins at a family reunion. Thank you and take care. Peace. Hello and welcome to The Deadly Atheist. I'm Chris Mallard. Thank you for joining me. In this episode of the Evil God Monster of Abraham series, we'll cover Genesis chapter 11 in the Book of Death. The chapter in which God confused the languages of men we get to enjoy the misogynistic lineage from Shem to Abram, and we see the first direct mention of incest in the Bible. Good, wholesome fun for the whole family. Stick around. Abraham will have to sacrifice a goat and say a prayer to purify you if you don't hit that subscribe button and that little notification bell. So do the thing. Abram and the goats need a break. Now, on with the show. Just a quick primer about chapter 11 in Genesis. It's broken into three parts. Part one is the story of the city of Babel. Part two is more useless begats running from Shem to Abram. More wasted space as they already covered most of the lineage in the previous chapter. 
And finally, it closes by giving us our first introduction to Abram. So to part one, throughout my Evil God Monster of Abraham series, I've repeatedly mentioned that there seems to be no culture, music, or beauty of any kind so far in the Bible. No mention of great works of art, acts of kindness, glorious cities, or any measure of something we would know as civilization. In fact, we've already covered 10 chapters of the Bible, and so far we've encountered blood, murder, misogyny, lots of misogyny, animal sacrifices, genocide, and the entire population of the planet apparently still lives in tents. But nothing we would consider civilization. Now, for the first time in the Bible, we're going to see men come together to build something great and wonderful. The first sign of the greatness of man mentioned in the Bible. Now, I already talked about tents, but in verse 3, chapter 11, the humans of earth up their game and start making bricks. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the earth. So finally, men are beginning to embrace civilization and increase their standard of living. Yay! But wait, God doesn't see this as good. Now, I thought the reason God didn't like it was because they blasphemed and were thinking they could touch the heavens and be like God. But nowhere in the text does it say that. I checked several versions and the only sin or possibly negative thing I could find was where they said they wanted to make a name for themselves. That's it. Nowhere, so far, does it say making a name for oneself is a bad thing. There's simply no good reason listed in the Bible as to why God would want to scatter people over the earth and confuse their languages. It reads as though God came down, saw that men were working together in peace and harmony, and became offended by their progress. Genesis chapter 11, verses 5-7 through seven. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speak in the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Now at this point, you'd think he'd be proud. It sounds like he just gave them a huge compliment, mad props and whatnot. When you work together, you can accomplish anything. But let's continue reading because that's not what he meant. The God monster goes on. Nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. Together they can do anything, and we can't have that shit. They are doing great, working together in apparent peace and harmony towards a common goal. A true God of peace and love and mercy, I suspect, would appreciate their efforts and applaud them. But a narcissistic, evil God monster filled with petty hate and rage might not be so pleased. And of course, you know how the story ends. God scatters people across the whole world and confuses their language. Literally, to keep them from succeeding. Again, just to kind of drive it in home, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. But we all know what's really going on here. The author of the Bible is merely trying to explain why there's so many different languages and not just a single language. Got it. Cool story, bro. Once again, you've painted your God in the shade of a real dick. It's not a lesson about the humility of man in the story of Babel. It's about the pettiness of God. Part 2. The Beguiling Begats of Misogyny Okay, so in the second part of this chapter, it doesn't actually use the word begat, but you know what I'm talking about. Shem was the son of Noah, and Shem had a son named Bob, who had many sons and daughters. And Bob had a son named Steve, who had sons and daughters, and Steve's son Hank, etc., etc., etc. Begat, begat, begat. But at least in this lineage, women get some mention when it says a man had sons and daughters. Otherwise, females are once again completely left out. Ten generations of a family line and not a single wife, daughter, or mother is named. A mind-numbingly boring waste of text, space, and time. On to part three. We meet the father of the Abrahamic religion, and we see direct biological and marital incest in the Bible for the first time. Terah had three sons, Abram, who would later go on to become Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Haran had a son, Lot, and then he dies. And then we come to verse 29 of chapter 11 of Genesis. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Ishka. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Nahor's wife 
is the daughter of Haran. So, so Abram's brother was married to his own niece, the daughter of his other dead brother. Yep. So there you have it. The second marital incest directly stated so far in the Bible. Now I'm not saying it's the second implied incest in the Bible. If we were talking implied incest, we'd need to start with Eve and her sons. If the creation story is to be believed, either Eve had sex with her sons or Adam and Eve had other daughters with whom Cain and Abel had sex with to initially populate the earth. Either way, incest would need to be involved. Then later, Noah's sons and wives and their children would have to have been incestuous again in order to repopulate the earth after the flood. All implied incest. But verse 29 specifically tells us the dude married his own niece. Naughty, naughty, naughty. So is that bad? Is that incest? Uncle and niece? I mean, even in the South, that raise an eyebrow or two. But who, you ask, is the first marital incest directly stated in the Bible? Well, it's Abram and Sarai. They're not kissing cousins or uncle and niece, nothing like that. No, they are brother and sister. Yep, the father of the Abrahamic religion was in an incestuous marriage with his own sister. Twice in the upcoming chapters, Abram, or Abraham, being a brave and noble man, a man of honor and strength, will pass off his wife as his sister and give her to other men to save his own hide. Genesis 12 and Genesis chapter 20. But what many don't know is that she really was his sister according to him. The second man he gave his wife to asked him why he would do such a thing. And his response is in Genesis 20, verses 12. Besides, she really is my sister, the daughter of my father, though not my mother. And she became my wife. So Abram's brother married his own dead brother's daughter, and Abram married his own sister. This is the man who in later chapters speaks to God and goes on to be the father of the Abrahamic religions. The patriarch of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam is literally introduced as an incestuous scumbag from a family of incestuous scumbags. Exactly the kind of craziness you'd expect from the evil god monster of Abraham and its book of death. So what do you think? Did you know Abram and Sarai were both husband and wife and brother and sister? Let me know in the comments below. If you like what I do and you'd like to support my cause, follow the links in the description below to my Patreon and find a tier that works for you. Thank you for all your help and support. I appreciate it. Thumbs up goes a long way. Remember, spare Abram some goats and give me a thumbs up, a like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. Thank you. Hello and welcome to The Daily Atheist. I'm Chris Mallard. Thank you for joining me. In this episode of the Evil God Monster of Abraham series, we'll cover Genesis chapter 12 in the Book of Death. The chapter in which Abram leaves his father's home, moves to Egypt, then he and his sister wife give the Pharaoh of Egypt a sexually transmitted disease. Stick around. Protect yourself from Abram's crotch cricket curse by reaching out and clicking that subscribe button, then hitting that little notification bell. Keep your jiggly bits safe, my friends. Now, on with the show. I have to be honest, these next few chapters which contain the story of Abram slash Abraham are some of my favorite chapters in the Old Testament. In case you're unaware, the Abram I'm talking about is the same Abram who is considered the father of the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. To catch you up, Abram is a direct descendant of Noah who is of course about 10 generations removed from Adam. Abram, or Abraham as he's later known, is considered the father of these faiths because in subsequent chapters he'll go on to make the first covenant with God, securing the position of God's chosen people for the ancient Hebrews. In the last chapter, we learned of the incestuous nature of his family. One of Abram's brothers married his own niece, and Abram married his own half-sister. In later chapters, Lot, Abram's nephew, will go on to have incestuous sex and subsequently children with his own daughters. So far, 11 chapters into the Book of Death, and every major family or hero is in some way in an incestuous relationship, either implied or directly stated. Who did Cain and Abel have children with to populate the earth? Either their mother or sisters that Adam and Eve produced later. Who did the children of Noah breed with to repopulate the earth? He had three sons who had one wife each. At best, it was first cousin on first cousin after that. Then we get to Abram and his family, and the Bible directly tells us they married within their own family. Abram married his own sister, and his brother Nahor married his own niece. 
By our modern notions, marital incest is not generally something you go around bragging about, let alone writing down in a holy text. But the Bible makes no effort to hide it. Of course, scientifically, we know the harms of inbreeding, such as physical deformities and mental handicaps. And there is absolutely no reason to believe incest wasn't the norm for the entire lineage, from Adam right down to Abram. So what kind of quality offspring could Abram possibly have been? Hmm? Now, on to chapter 12. This chapter opens with God telling Abram to leave his father's house and that God will make Abram a great nation. So the spry young Abram picks up his bride Sarai and his nephew Lot, and they toddle off into the desert. Well, he's not really spry so much. Genesis 12 verse 4 says he was 75 years old when he left his father's household. And in Genesis chapter 17, we learn that Sarai is about 10 years younger than Abram. So we'll pin her at around 65 years old when they leave. They traveled to the land of Canaan, to the great tree of Moriah, then onto the hills east of Bethel. Then they set out for Negev, but a famine forced them down to Egypt. Now, here's where things get really interesting. As they were about to enter Egypt, he says, Genesis 12, verses 11 through 13, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When these Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. Wait, what? Yeah, based on what we know so far, Sarai is at least 65 years old and bred from the same incestuous stock as Abram, because they're brother and sister, right? And considering all the hard desert miles she's bound to have had on her and the lack of any modern form of dentistry, etc., I seriously doubt she's the oil of Olay model type of 65 plus. And yet here he is telling her that she's so beautiful, he'll get killed if she claims to be his wife. So she needs to pretend to be his sister. Really? That's just crazy. So that's how it was done in Egypt back in the day. If you saw a hot gilf passing through the town, the general rule was to murder her elderly husband and take her a prize. Well, maybe. Genesis 12, 14 and 15. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken to his palace. Okay, so this dilapidated desert daisy was so beautiful that the Pharaoh's men saw her and were so taken by her that they felt the need to literally go tell the Pharaoh. And of all the young and beautiful women of Egypt, the Pharaoh ends up going for this gorgeous goat herding granny. Right. But you know what? Apparently it paid off. Genesis 12 verse 16 says, He, the Pharaoh, treated Abram well for her sake. And Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. So what do you think the Bible author means by for her sake? For her beauty or for her vagina? I find it highly unlikely in such a savage land as Egypt is being portrayed that the Pharaoh gave all that wealth just so he could simply look upon her beauty. And if all he wanted to do was gaze upon her grain granny goods, he could have done that whether she was Abram's sister, wife, brother, it didn't, that, that doesn't matter, right? To add to the dripping misogyny, notice the reward doesn't go to her. It goes to Abram. She's used as little more than a streetwalker, and all the wealth goes to her pimp, I mean husband. I mean, it, it sure looks like Abram is literally pimping his wife out to the Pharaoh. Is the lesson to be learned here that you can give your sister wife to another man as a method of acquiring wealth? Great moral grounding for a religion. Imagine basing your religion on indecent proposal 2000 BC. So if before seeing this video, I told you that the father of the Abrahamic religion literally whored out his sister wife to the Pharaoh of Egypt for some coin, cattle, and slaves, would you have believed me? Well, here it is. He claims it was out of fear for his life, but it sure seems more like it was a business transaction to me. And didn't he have the power of God to protect him? He was already talking to God. No power there? Anyway, and now my friends, as if to bolster the notion Pharaoh was knocking boots with Sarai, the part you've all been waiting for, Genesis 12 verse 17 says, but the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. That's right. Sarai gave Pharaoh an STD, which he proceeded to give to his wives and around his household.
As you can imagine, the Pharaoh was pissed. Verses 18 through 20. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me? He said, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then here is your wife, take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. Notice, despite Pharaoh's anger, he didn't ask for anything back. Instead, he told him to take everything and go, because that's what you do when somebody gives you the cooties. You don't want anything from them. Take your shit and go. And so, you know, if Sarai had an STD, then Abram had it. Abram starts talking to an imaginary creature and eventually starts mutilating himself by cutting off the end of his dick, a trick he learned while they were in Egypt, by the way. But let's not jump too far ahead, okay? We'll get to that part soon enough. Hmm. Fodder for another chapter. So far, though, everything the Bible has had to say about Abram reflects very poorly about his character and his lineage. Yet this horror of a man is a prophet of God? Yep. But not of a kind, loving, gentle, merciful God. No, but this is exactly the kind of prophet you'd expect from the evil God monster of Abraham and its book of death. Hmm? If you like what I do and you'd like to support my cause, follow the link in the description below to my Patreon and find a tier that works for you. Thank you for all your help and support. I appreciate it. Remember, avoid getting the profit plague on your crotch critter by clicking that subscribe button and hitting that little notification bell. Thank you and take care. Hello and welcome to The Daily Atheist. I'm Chris Mallard. Thank you for joining me. In this episode of the Evil God Monster of Abraham series, we'll cover Genesis chapter 13 in the Book of Death, the chapter in which Abram and Lot are so wealthy from their adventures in Egypt that they decide to go their separate ways. And Abram's imaginary God starts giving away other people's stuff. Stick around. Don't let shifty inbred prophets take your stuff in the name of their imaginary gods. Protect yourself by hitting that subscribe button and then that little notification bell. Stay safe, my friends. Now, on with the show. So, not a lot really happens in chapter 13. As we learned in chapter 12, Abraham pimped out his incestuous sister wife to the pharaoh of Egypt, and the book specifically states that he gained great wealth in the form of sheep, cattle, camels, and human slaves for doing so. It's hard to tell how much crotch coin came from renting out his sister wife's hoo-ha, but it must have been significant. In fact, he and Lot could travel just fine getting to Egypt, but they had both grown so wealthy that when they left Egypt, they were having trouble managing all their possessions. They traveled together for the bit, then they had to go their separate ways. Genesis 13, verses 5-7 through seven. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks of herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herders and Lot's. So they've grown so wealthy that they are having a hard time sharing the land, understandably. It's at this point that Abram comes up with a perfectly sensible notion of going their separate ways. Makes sense. Genesis 13, verses 8 and 9. So Abram said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and me, or between your herders and mine, for we are close relatives. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. I think it's pretty cool of Abram. He realizes the land can't handle them both and gives Lot his choice. No harm, no foul. Choose where you'd like to go, and I'll gladly go somewhere else. To that end, Genesis 13, verses 10 through 13. Lot looked around and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan towards Zor was well watered, like a garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. For the record, I'd like to point out that the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah are also Canaanites, still vilifying the descendants of Ham. So at this point, Abram is giving away land he doesn't own to his nephew Lot. Then, just to keep things interesting, Abram's God does the same thing. It waits until Lot leaves, then it gives everything, including the land just given to Lot by Abram, to Abram. It's all his. His delusional God just hefted him the land of dozens of other tribes 
and peoples, and we know how land wars turn out. Genesis chapter 13, verse 14. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted from him, Look around from where you are, to the north and south, to the east and west. All the land that you see I will give to you and your offsprings forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. A recurring theme of taking land already owned and populated by someone else because a voice in your head told you to do so, no matter how many people suffer and die. Exactly what you'd expect from the evil god monster of Abraham and his book of death. If you like what I do and want to support my cause, follow the links in the description below to my Patreon and find a tier that works for you. Also, I have some wonderful merch. Again, links are in the description below. Thank you for all your support. I appreciate it. You guys are so wonderful. Remember, don't let the imaginary gods of dead prophets give away your crap by hitting that subscribe button, that little notification bell. Take care, my friends. Thank you.